You may be seated. All right. Well, let's take our Bibles tonight. Let's go to the book of Romans, chapter number 14, if we could. Romans, chapter number 14. Tonight, we don't have a PowerPoint, so you're just going to have to turn the passages with me. But uh, we're going to look at Romans 14 tonight will be in our text. Franklin Roosevelt's closest advisor during much of his presidency was a man by the name of Harry Hopkins. During World War II, when his influence with Roosevelt was at its peak, Hopkins held no official cabinet position. Moreover, Hopkins' closeness to Roosevelt caused many to regard him as a shadowy, sinister figure. As a result, he, he was a major political liability to the president. A political fool once asked Roosevelt, why do you keep Hopkins so close to you? You surely realize that people distrust him and resent his influence. Roosevelt replied, someday you may well be sitting here where I am now as president of the United States. And when you are, you'll be looking at that door over there and knowing that practically everybody who walks through it wants something out of you. You'll learn what a lonely job this is, and you'll discover the need for somebody like Harry Hopkins who asks for nothing except to serve you. Winston Churchill rated Hopkins as one of the half dozen most powerful men in the world in the early 1940s, and the sole source of Hopkins' power was his willingness to serve. Tonight we're going to pick up our series of per, on personal responsibility, and our focus will be centered on remembering that we are responsible for the influence God allows us to have in the lives of people. Everyone is influencing someone. And our desire should be to influence others, certainly in the direction towards the Lord Jesus Christ, and certainly not away from him tonight. Romans 14, we're going to pick it up in verse 10. It says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us there not, not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. My text really is going to focus primarily on verse 13 night, that we put no stumbling block or influence another in a way in which they would fall, in a way that's away from the Lord. And tonight, Let's talk about this a little bit more as we talk about personal responsibility and how we are to really shepherd our influence tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for this opportunity to be able to look into the Word of God. I pray that you would meet with us tonight. Lord, I pray that you would speak very clearly on this subject matter and help us to realize the influence we're having, whether we realize it or not, so that you may be glorified and honored. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's been a few weeks now since we've been in this series, and I thought it for a few moments I would just remind us why we're in this study tonight. As saved people here, each one of us is one day going to give an account for our lives before the Lord. Now, that's a real sobering thing. I appreciate uh, Pastor Hoyseth here a couple weeks ago. I think it was in the Sunday morning message. He talked about the judgments that are coming. He talked about the great white throne, and he talked about the... Uh, the um, the judgment seat of Christ. And that's really the, the thing we're talking about uh, more than anything else in this series. But we are going to give an account for the lives in which we live as born-again Christians. The context, again, of our passage reminds us of that fact. We see that in verses 10 through 12 again. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. And then verse 12, boy, it's so clear. Such a simple verse, but it says, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. One day after we, we get to heaven, we're going to sit before the Lord, and he's going to bring up the files. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have a, a little bit of a, a, a job assessment going on here. A job review, as it were, of, of, of our lives. And, and how, we, how we manage them. And how we, and what we did with them, and uh, we're going to see, I think, in a lot clearer view, a lot of things that maybe we, we didn't think about before, or we dismissed, or we, are we, we, we weren't being very cognizant of, as we lived this life, and I, I think it's going to be a very sobering time. 
And, and, it can, and what we would rather it be as much as possible a joyous time. I think every one of us are going to have some things that aren't we wish we had done better. But hopefully tonight we're going to be we're going to, we're pushing towards the thing of having a better review, as it were, versus something that's a complete letdown and a disappointment for us. We as saved people stand before this judgment seat of Christ, and we will give an account of what we do with this life. We will be commended or we will be rebuked depending upon our decisions and, independ- and rewards will be divvied out appropriately according to our faithfulness and a loss of rewards according to our unfaithfulness. And this is a very big deal. I think sometimes as born again Christians it's very easy to kind of forget things we, we think we're saved, we're on the road to heaven and thank God we'll never lose that. But this is a very big deal. There's a lot of emphasis in the scriptures from the Lord about putting up your rewards in heaven and, and that he's coming back and his reward is with him. And there's a, lot, there's a lot that's mentioned throughout the scriptures about this judgment seat. Or, or at least it's inferred by these various scriptures. And this is a very big deal for there will be Christian people who will suffer loss as a result of the way they chose to live their lives while here on earth. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, if you want to flip ahead there, one of such passages that deals with this. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, and we'll just pick it up in verse 11. It says, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work for what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall, notice, suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Our works are the way our behaviors, in so many words, are going to be tested by the fires of the Lord. And uh, what comes out is going to be our reward. If there's ever anything burned up, well, we are going to suffer loss. There, there is a suffering of loss. In fact, if you go to Matthew chapter 25, again, another well-known passage in regards to uh, our responsibility before the Lord and how he's going to bring us into account one day, we have the parable of the talents. And if you're familiar with this, and I think many of us are, it's, it's pictured as a man traveling into a far country, and he gives unto certain servants different talents. One he gave five talents, one he gave two talents, one he gave one talent. And he's gone for a while, and then he comes back. Of course, I think we can understand what that all pictures. The Lord is, uh, is away now in heaven, but one day he's going to come back, and, and then he's going to bring in these servants into account. And that's, of course, a picture of us. We, we pick it up, though, in verse number 24. Uh, the first two, the uh, servants, you know, they doubled what they did. The f- guy who had five uh, made five more. The guy who had two made two more, and both were, were given high marks of commendation. But then there's that third one. And he was the one that only received one talent. And may I say, maybe there was a reason why he only received one talent, based on what you see here. But this is a very, very... Um, very strong passage here as we, as we see how this man didn't do anything with his talent. He buried it, as it were, and how the Lord responded to that. Look at verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid my talent, hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said to him, Thou, whoa, look at this, look at this phrase. Look, look at it real close. Wicked and slothful servant. Wow. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? You know, the Lord doesn't really mince words a whole lot, does he? He's pretty direct <laughs> at times. And this is once the case here. Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. Take therefore the talent from it, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye out the unprofitable servant. Unto outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
What does he call him? An unprofitable servant. Unprofitable servant. You know, the Lord does not want us to be unprofitable servants. And there's really no excuse why any of us should be that, to be honest with you. We know these things. We know what's right. We know what the Lord says. And we see here that there's just going to be this great regret and strong rebuke that takes place. And shame, considering what others have been willing to do for the glory of God and what they've been willing to give up, even to the case of their own lives. I want to encourage us tonight that it is well worth our time to give God everything we have so that we can seek to hear, uh, like verse 21 of this passage says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now maybe tonight you say, I didn't start very well, Pastor. (laughs) Well, you can finish well. You can finish well. Or maybe you started well and kind of fell off the wagon. Guess what? You can get back on the right, get going in the right direction again. What's nice is God does give second chances. The just man falls seven times and rises up again. But you have to rise up again. You, can, you and I can make some good choices and, we can, and we, can, we can finish strong regardless of how maybe things are going right now or have in the past. But it, it is good for us to take an honest assessment of our lives. You know, if we were to die right now and stand before the judgment seat of Christ, would you, how would you feel? as an individual. You ever thought about that? How would you feel with where you're at right now spiritually? Do you feel feel like you would hear the well done, or do you feel like, oh boy, I'm really nervous about that? I'm sure we all would feel a little bit nervous. I think I would as well. But but you know what? If that's something that really would bother us, maybe we need to take an assessment of how things are going truly. And maybe just simply make some course corrections. But it's good for us to take an honest assessment, assessment, though. Does God's Spirit speak to us about something, some things that maybe just need to get straightened out? And maybe, maybe we need to shed out of our lives, or, or, or that's going to make our day at the judgment seat not as well of, a, of an event as we would like. Could there be areas that we need attention You know, we're trying to cover various areas of life in which we will give an account for as a means of preparation for that day. And this is a, you know, uh, this is a a time that we come together because we want to prepare. You know, it's kind of like some of those tests. Uh, Some of you probably have taken an ACT or an SAT test that you have to take in order to to enter into college, so forth, and you know they have books about that thick that you can study for those types of uh, those types of tests and so forth. And people will get those and and uh, and uh, study those. I never did any of that stuff. I still aced it, anyways. <laughs> no, <laughs> I wish I took it once, and that was good enough <laughs> for me. <laughs> but but in all seriousness, you know. There's, there's material that people get for those types of tests and those types of things to prepare themselves for that. And, and whatever it is, you know, we want to prepare for it. We want to understand what God expects. We can't be ignorant of that. Well, tonight I want to focus on another area that, the Christ, that Christian people need to be, again, cognizant of. We need to be aware of when it comes to our accountability before God, and that is our influence. And maybe you don't think about that a whole lot, but it is significant more than you realize. Our influence in the lives of others. And, and as we, if, we are, if we're aware of this, then I think it will require us or will, will encourage us to be guarded when it comes to our Christian testimony in front of others. That we will guard ourselves and and behave ourselves like Christians are supposed to behave, as it were. For if we fail to do so, we can lead others astray and even away from God, like our passage mentions in verse 13, that we don't put a stumbling block in the occasion for somebody to fail and to fall because of our behavior. And that dissuades them from following the Lord, or even in some cases, not get saved. Not get saved. 
So tonight, let's consider this in a little bit more detail, if we could. First of all, let's just define it. Point one, the definition, as it were. What does it mean? What is, what is influence? Well, influence, by definition, is the capacity or the power of a person or thing to be a compelling force on the actions, behavior, opinions, etc., of others. A person with influence has the ability by their statements and actions to either persuade somebody or a group of people or dissuade them in their decisions. The more influential a person is, the more people that person will persuade or dissuade. And of course, the less influential, obviously, the fewer people that will be persuaded or dissuaded. How do people gain influence, though? We all naturally have it. But how is it built? How, how do people attain it? Well, one, uh, there's really two, three different ways. I'll just mention here briefly. Number one, this is probably the biggest one, is personal relationships with people. If you want to have an influence in somebody's life, build a personal relationship with them. Spend time with them, get to know them, come to understand them a little bit. And you'll gain influence one way or another. It's the, probably the most common way in which influence is imparted. And we, of course, as we have relationships with other people, we just naturally build influence in their lives. People know us personally, too, and they can discern our integrity of our character at the same time. But it's, you know, personal relationships are probably the, the biggest way in which influence is gained. In fact, if I can just say as a side note to parents here, or future parents as it were, um, your authority will wane as your children get older, which you need to build in their life more than anything else is influence. Is influence. Influence means that they respect you for who you are, and they will listen to what you have to say. If you do not build influence in their lives, they will not respect anything that you say. They will reject it. And you know why they will reject it? Because they don't believe that you have their best interest in heart. That's why they reject it. That's what they've come to believe. And you know why they've come to believe it? It's probably because you have not built a personal relationship built on love with them. So regardless of what stage your kid is at, young or old, that's where you have to start if you're going to have any hope of any influence in their lives. And the younger you can do that, the better off here you are. Influence is a big thing. Of course, we want to influence people for God, right? And that starts, one of the best ways you do that is by personal relationships. It really does make a, a big difference. Number two, through actions or successes or behaviors, if you will. I can put it this way. A proven track record of success gains influence in the lives of of other people. And it's through those quote unquote successes we gain respect, which garners a level of influence. I think a great example of that is when David beat Goliath. David beat Goliath, and all of a sudden, what? They were singing all the top songs about him, right? <laughs> We've even had renditions here down at church. <laughs> They're pretty good. We might have, we have to record those, I guess. David's life is ten thousands. Saul is thousands, right? But what happened? He had, he got instant influence because of what he did, right? And so much so that it actually threatened Saul. Now that's a good way of doing it. When you do something for the Lord, and the Lord gives you that kind of influence in the lives of people. And what has happened is that respect is gained, which garners a certain level of influence. Number three, I, I put this in here, and it's, and it's not a foolproof thing, but it is all, it, there, is a, there is something to it, and that's position. Now, title and position don't guarantee your ability to influence anybody. You can have a big title, but nobody can be listening to you, right? Nobody will listen to you. And uh, you'll have very little influence in others' lives if you don't have any personal relationships with them or you have no track record of any success. 
But position does give you a platform. And sometimes God does put you in a position for the opportunity to be an influence. And depending upon that person, they can grow it or squander it depending upon the relationships they build and their track record. But whether we realize it or not, we all, again, have some level of influence. I'll guarantee you, even amongst your home, amongst your littlest of children, you'll see influence being occurring in the lives of, of your kids. You'll see influence. I, I've watched as our kids have grown up and how one influences the other, and I'm sure if you have kids in your home, you see a lot of times it's the, the older ones that influence the younger ones, right? Generally speaking. Now, it can flip the other way too, but, but generally speaking, that's, that's the way it works. But it tells us one thing this, and there's a, it, it's a f- cliche, if you will, but no man is an island. No man is an island. In other words, our lives impact other people more than we sometimes think that they do. And we may say, well, I don't have a position. I don't have a title. I'm not, I, I'm just little old me. Well, guess what? Little old you has an impact on somebody's life. It really does. Look at verse 7 of Romans 14. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. No man liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Our lives impact the lives of other people in some capacity. And sometimes that even might be silently. In fact, there's a lot more that happens silently than we realize. And people watch our behaviors. And they, they, they see what we do. They see what we don't do. They see how we behave in the house of God. They see all that kind of stuff. Oh, little eyes are everywhere, and big eyes are too, aren't they? They're, they're always looking for, there's always a, a influencing going on more than we, again, would like to admit. I think it was years ago, uh, uh, there was an NBA player, his name was Charles Barkley. He was, he's a well-known individual, kind of a brash individual, particularly when he was a player. But there, there, he, count, he came under controversy, it was, I think it was back in the 90s, for making a statement about how he was not a role, a role model. He was not a role model. And he got taken to task for that, and he said, no, uh, I'm not a role model. I get paid to do what I do. I get paid for that. And, and then, if, if I remember correctly, he kind of pointed it at other people who, who really should be the role models of, of children, like their parents and other godly figures. Uh, that's very true. Our lives affect the lives of others in some capacity. That's why Paul states in our text, hey look, don't be worrying about what everyone else is doing. You better just watch out for what you're doing. Because you don't want to put a stumbling block before the Lord because you are, and me into us as individuals we're all going to stand before God. And we don't want to cause somebody to fall, if we, at all possible. It's, it's not hard for us to reason that as our capacity as well, to ha- our capacity to influence others grow, so will our accountability for it. Jesus made a statement in Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, what much shall be required. To whom much is given, much shall be required. And that, that, that plays out in so many, all of the areas of our life. Whatever God's given you as far as influence, position, money, location where you live, all these different things, we, are give, we have to give an account for that. And if we have more than somebody else, so much the more we're going to be accountable for it. So much the more. I don't think it's hard for us to understand as well that God wants us influencing people towards him. Regardless of how little or large our influence is. And by the way, if you want your influence to grow, then you have to be willing to influence and be faithful in the influence that we currently have. 
The more influence God gives us, the greater capacity we have to move people towards God, which results in greater fruit and greater reward. But you have to start with what God has given you to begin with. And be faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful in the big things. Amen. So it's important that we steward this correctly. Influence, again, is really just our capacity to, in, to, uh, to compel others to persuade them or dissuade them. And in, in the context of what we're talking about regarding the things surrounding the Lord. Secondly, let's talk about the demonstration. How much does our influence make a difference in the lives of others? Well, the Bible gives us several demonstrations in which people influence others both negatively and positively. Consider some tonight that are mentioned. And there are so many but I wanted to try to hit some, some good ones. I think number one, as far as a positive influence from Scripture, I think the Apostle Paul was a very positive influence in the Scriptures. Let's go to Acts 19. Acts number 19. So much so that even the lost recognized the influence of Paul in bringing people out of idolatry and into worship of the one true God. Look at Acts 19, verse 26. This was a silversmith that was trying to raise up problems for Paul. And it's a long story that takes place in Ephesus. But it mentions here in verse 26, Moreover, you see and hear that not alone in Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this is Asia Minor, of course, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. Notice here it says they persuaded and turned much people. Paul had a very positive influence. And of course, Paul's desire was to promote Christ. And he was being very successful at being a positive influence for the Lord. Now it cost him at times, certainly. But he was, you notice here, look at the opinions of the lost in verse 26. Wow. What, what an incredible testimony of a man who stewarded his influence for the Lord. And he had a, his life was very impactful. Many people turn to God. Using an Old Testament example, there was Daniel. Daniel. I believe Daniel had influence in the, in the lives of many powerful people. And by the way, the reason God gave him that influence was because he was faithful when it was hard. You look at the story of Daniel and the backdrop and everything Daniel went through to begin with, but he remained faithful to his God, right? He wouldn't defile himself with the king's meat. That's where it started. After all that had happened to him and any, every reason that was thrown at him to give up and quit on God, and he could have very easily done it, and there are people that quit and give up on God by far, far for far less reasons, Daniel stayed faithful. And God placed him in a position to use, that in, to, use, to use him to be an influence in two world empires. Think about that for just a little bit. Two world empires. But he had, I believe he had influence on his three other Hebrew companions. We know to be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He had influence on Nebuchadnezzar's life. I believe he was the, Daniel's testimony amongst probably the three Hebrews as well um, led to the salvation of Nebuchadnezzar. I think we read about that in Daniel 4. And then there was Darius, right? After Babylon was washed away, Medo-Persian came in and Daniel became one of the leading presidents of that time. In fact, there was 120, uh, I believe, uh, leaders that were appointed by Darius. There was three top dogs, of which Daniel was one of them, and then the king was going to put him at number one. That's what got him. That's what drove the other guys wild and and tried to plot against him to get him thrown in the lion's den. But why could he do that? Because he was a man of influence, and he influenced things for God in a positive way, and he made a positive impact in in these heathen nations as powerful as they were. Then there was Joseph. Joseph. You know, he influenced the Pharaoh after the interpretation of his dream to make him second in command of all Egypt. 
If you follow that story in Genesis 31, and we don't have time to go there tonight, but if you follow when, when, what takes place when Joseph gets before Pharaoh, and he interprets the dream, and he's, and, and he's just speaking. He's not looking for position. I'm sure he was thinking, well, I'll be heading back to the dungeon. You know, this was always happened to me. <laughs> Maybe type attitude. But, but he tells the Pharaoh, this is what you've got to do. You've got to get somebody who can organize and, and save grain during those seven years of plenty so that when the seven years of famine come, there's plenty of food and, and things for the people and just get that in order. And, and uh, search out a man, Pharaoh. Find somebody who can do that. And Pharaoh's like, you're the guy, man. <laughs> is it, who, has, who has the Spirit of God within him? And it has shown such wisdom. And, and in one day... Joseph went from the pit to the palace. I mean, it was from the prison house to the palace. It's an incredible story of God's ability to reverse things on a dime. But that influence placed him in a position to influence more people for the glory of God. Now, we could talk about David. We could talk about Moses. We could talk about Joshua. We could talk about the prophets. We could talk about some other of the kings that existed who love God and influence others to do the same. May I say that? That's, again, exactly what God wants out of our lives. That we are not a stumbling block. We don't give an occasion for the enemies of God to blaspheme. But we are not, we're not a stumbling block, but a stepping stone for the spiritual well-being and growth of other people. But just as much as there are positive examples of influence, there are also negative ones that the Scriptures list. I think one that glared, one that stuck out in my mind immediately when I was putting this message together was Peter. It was Peter. Go to John chapter 21. Peter. Peter was the one that was always at the top of the list. He, he was uh, the, the number one disciple, as it were. He would be the first pastor of the Church of Jerusalem. But Peter after the resurrection of Christ, and maybe as a result of feeling guilty for his denial of Christ, appears to get backslidden. And he, even for a time, bowed out of the ministry. Look at John 21, verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night, that night they caught nothing. Notice here, out of now the remaining eleven disciples, how many Peter influenced. Thomas, which isn't surprising. He was the doubting Thomas. He was always looking for an escape route. Ah, Peter's going away, so I'm going to go away too. What's interesting about Thomas, he didn't have a whole lot of influence because when he skipped church that one night after the resurrection of Christ, nobody else was with him, right? It's just fitting where Thomas seems to fit in here. Anyways, but he was still, he was still swayed. And Nathaniel, James and John, and two others. What is that, seven? Seven out of the, oh, that's seven people. Eight would be Peter. So there's three other disciples that, that didn't get caught up in this. Think about this here. He pulled down a lot of people, didn't he? A lot of highly influential people at that time. Highly influential people. It's very sobering as I've seen people who have gained a fair amount of influence and have pulled down others with them as the result of their backslidden state or their bitter state that they've gotten into. I've seen enough of them over the years. People who had once been in positions of leadership even, who, uh, who have gotten a, a burr in their saddle and pulled other people down to do that. That happens. Hey, if you're in a position of authority even, we had better be aware that it, we pull people down because of our influence or position, as it were, and cause them to go away from God instead of towards God, God will hold us accountable for them. He will hold us accountable for them. 
Sometimes they think that using their influence to gain a following is the way to go about it. But God, every person that we pull down and the influence, those, the impact that has on the lives that they influence, I would not want to be accountable for that if I can have, if at all possible. And I've known enough people over the years who have knocked others out of church because they got a bad attitude and, and, and they were just decided to do their own thing. And that's exactly what happened here with Peter. Look at what Peter pulled down. I'm out of the ministry. Who's with me? Seven other people. Wow. Wow. Then there was those ten spies who entered into Canaan. If you remember the story of the Jews' initial opportunity to enter the promised land, Moses sent in twelve spies to check out the land. And when they came back after 40 days, what happened? Well, two came back, and they, and they gave a good report. That was Caleb and Joshua. They recognized there were challenges, but they believed God was able to overcome them. But then the other ten, what did they do? The Bible says that they gave an evil report. They gave an evil report, and they, and they began to say how it was impossible for them to get into, go into that land. The... the they're giants. We look like grasshoppers in comparison to them. Uh, their, their cities are fenced and overcome. We are unable to do it. And what ended up happening, despite the pleas from Joshua and Caleb, the people got all up in arms, rebelled against the idea of going into the promised land, wanted to make a captain that would march them all the way back to Egypt. And then God came down and, and he was not happy had it not been for the intercession of Moses once again. That might have been the end of that group. But God said this group is not going in. That whole, that bad in this bad influence cost the whole generation. Instead of being in the promised land, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. For 40 years they wandered around in this desert because of the influence of 10 men. Of 10 men. It cost them. Now there are many other examples that exist in Scripture, but the point is the same. Our lives have influence on the lives of others, and we do not want to become a stumbling block to them. God wants us to use, use us to, to influence for righteousness, not towards rebellion. Hence, it is very important that we guard our testimony, we guard our decisions, so that we can influence people in a proper manner. As we see thirdly and finally, the duty. God gives each of us, again, a level of influence in the lives of others. Some more, some less. And as I've stated throughout the message, we are, of course, to steward that influence faithfully for the Lord. If we do so, God will give us more opportunity to influence more people and vice versa if we do not. You know, we can gain influence, but we can lose it too. Dependent upon the decisions that we make in life and the, the way we behave. It's our duty to seek to maintain a testimony, though, that will allow us to be a proper influence. And really, that, that, that's kind of where it starts. We've talked about staying in love with Jesus, about being holy and, and those types of things hey, if we stay right with God, we'll be able to influence right. But if, we don't, if we're not right with God, if we push our, our relationship to, with the Lord to, aside, then we will gain no influence at all. We'll be a Christian that everyone mocks behind our back as being a hypocrite. And we don't want to be that. We don't want to be that at all. It's our duty to seek to maintain a testimony, a realness, a genuineness about our Christian life. That people, know, people can, who walk around, and even if they don't agree with us, say, you know, he or she is the real deal. He or she is the real deal in life. And really, that's our duty. That requires us to stay right with God. That requires us to be faithful to what we know is true. We don't know everything and, and understandable. Now, that's understandable, but we are responsible to be faithful with what we do know. 
If we know to do right and doeth it not, the Bible says that is sin. If we know what, what's the right thing to do and we just choose to do not because we just don't feel like it, that's still sin. And that will not produce a genuine, real Christian life that will have any type of influence in the lives of others. Even if it's a secret sin. Oh, none of us are going to get away with that. Years ago, the communist government in China commissioned an author to write a biography of Hudson Taylor with the purpose of distorting the facts and presenting him in a bad light. They wanted to discredit the name of this consecrated missionary of the gospel. As the author was doing his research, though, he was increasingly impressed by Taylor's saintly character and godly life, and he found it extremely difficult to carry out his assigned task with a clear conscience. Eventually, at the risk of losing his life, he laid aside his pen renounced his atheism, and received Christ as his Savior. Again, the lesson is, whether we realize it or not, our example leaves an impression on others. May we leave the right one tonight and realize tonight that we are accountable for the influence that we're leaving on other people that God gives us influence in. May God help us tonight to steward appropriately. Let's stand to our